In the unconscious psyche, there are energy clusters called the complexes. Although the complexes are unconscious, they can nevertheless behave in us like additional consciousness or personalities. This fact was first discovered by Pierre Zanet through whose efforts a very fragmented female hysteria patient was able to recount her conscious processes orally to her doctor while simultaneously writing down with her left hand what her unconscious was saying. She could also to some extent enable a second unconscious person, a complex, to express itself. And here it became clear that the manifestations of the second person also possessed a certain consciousness, a certain ability to reason and to calculate and had effects as well. In order to distinguish this phenomenon from ego consciousness, Jung referred to the consciousness of the unconscious complex as a luminosity. Complexes possesses something resembling a rather diffuse unclear consciousness. This is clearest in cases in which an unconscious complex makes an arrangement which is something that can be observed in strongly fragmented personalities. Now Jung did not see the complexes as something purely pathological, as the psychiatry of his time was inclined to do and as Freudian psychology did as well. Rather, he assumed the existence of normal complexes. In other words, our psychic system is composed of various complexes, of which the ego complex is only one among various others, and this is normal. Every human being has complexes, and these are not in themselves the cause of psychological illness. They are part of the normal psychic makeup. These normal complexes that everyone has are what Jung called archetypes. The archetypes are more or less the inborn normal complexes that we all have. Thus Jung understood archetypes to be inborn dispositions or unobservable psychic structures that in recurring typical situations produce similar structured ideas, thoughts, emotions, and fantasy motives. Now there is a difference between the archetype in itself and the archetypal image. In other words, archetypes are in themselves completely unobservable structures. Only when they are stimulated by some inner or outer state of need do they, at crucial moments, produce an archetypal image, an archetypal fantasy, a thought, an intuition, or an emotion. This can be recognized as archetypal because they are similar in all cultures and among all people. At this point, that may seem a bit abstractly formulated, but if we read a collection of love songs or war songs from all over the world, we will see that people in such archetypal situations ever and again express similar feelings, ideas, and fantasies. There is no doubt that the archetypal structures are inherited. This is not however the case with the images. For example, a tribal child when an image of something overwhelmingly terrifying needs to take shape in him, will perhaps fantasize about a crocodile or a lion and an European child in the same situation will imagine a truck that is barreling towards him, threatening to run him over. Only the structure of something overpoweringly threatening will be the same in this case. The image is of course enriched by the impressions from the external world. Another point to note about the archetypes is that they get contaminated with one another. They merge one into the other. They are not like separate particles, as electrons were formerly viewed as little particles but are more like an electron cloud. Archetypes are like a blood cloud. At their edges, they run over into parallel phenomena. For example, it often cannot be said of an archetypal image exactly which archetype it belongs to. Let us take the following image as an example. In the tomb of King Setos I, there is a representation of a tamarisk tree with a breast and the king is sucking on it. Now is this an image of the archetype of the Great Mother or the archetype of the Tree of Life? Both. We cannot separate the archetypes from each other. They do not swim around in the collective unconscious like pieces of bread in a soup, but rather they are the whole soup at every point 
and therefore always appear in specific mixtures. That is also why they are so hard to describe clearly outside of an individual psychological context.